This video is brought to you by Brilliant.org. Final preps for the SpaceX Starship orbital test flight are ongoing. But how long do we have to wait? How many more days until SpaceX is flight ready? Let's find out. What about it? Go for launch. Or go for launch. Let's light this candle. Ignition sequence start. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? SpaceX is almost done installing Raptor 2 engines under Starship Booster 7, Ship 24 is ready for the static fire and the fuel farm is rapidly being filled. What does that mean for us space fans? Let's dive right in. Starship Updates SpaceX is on the final stretch towards the orbital launch. I know, we thought this would happen half a year ago, but this time it's real. This time SpaceX is performing tasks that only lead to one goal. Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography did another one of his famous flybys, and even though it was rather cloudy that day, the results were stunning as always. This is the Mega Bay at SpaceX's Starbase production site, and there's a Starship booster in it. It looks like this from the ground and through Chief's camera. The picture is from June 1st and it shows Sir Gantry holding up a grid fin needed to control the booster's flight path when descending back down after a stage separation at around 100 kilometers above the planet. The close-up view shows how much more sophisticated the latest generation of prototypes at Starbase is. This can't be compared to Booster 4, which for a while was regarded as the booster to push the first Starship to orbit. SpaceX didn't sleep, and grid fins are only helpful for one scenario. A flight. Otherwise, it wouldn't make much sense to install them in the first place. Only a few weeks away, all Raptor engines needed for the first orbital flight are complete and being installed. Elon seems very confident at this point. So Booster 7 is the one, at least based on current plans, and Ship 24 is busy showing that it will be capable of performing that first almost orbit. Performing a test has a reason. You want to ensure that what you build will be up for the task. This is footage from May 27th and from one of the recent Ship 24 cryo tests as seen on Lab Padre's live cams. And it shows Ship 24 sneezing. <coughs> and while doing so, tiles can be seen falling off the hull. Viewed from a different angle, the tiles can clearly be seen as they get blown away from the ship. Right after a clearly audible bang, venting noise can be heard too. Something ruptured and caused the hull to bulge. In return, the heat tiles fell off. SpaceX workers can be seen entering one of the manholes on the Ship 24 fairing section and taking out this very bent pipe. So this test likely was a header tank test and this pipe just didn't hold up to the task. It must have ruptured inside the fairing section causing the hull to vibrate or even slightly bulge which caused the tiles to fall off. This is a perfect example for why these tests are done. If this happened during a flight, the heat shield would get damaged, a landing would likely be impossible, and maybe even an ascent to orbit. But is this a problem for SpaceX? It's precisely the opposite. Any of these problems occurring during a ground test can be fixed before a first flight. So every time something like this happens, the SpaceX engineers likely are happy about it. It allows them to improve the design and make it more capable. Since it happened, SpaceX has been busy fixing Ship 24. The ruptured transfer pipe was replaced and the heat shield is being repaired. Next, I expect them to do another header tank test with Ship 24 and then proceed to a thrust simulator test on one of the older suborbital pads. And finally, after that, a first static fire with Raptor 2 engines. SpaceX has also finally revealed how they will proceed with Booster 7. Musk tweeted just one at a time at first, and he answered the everyday astronaut asking a question the rest of us have asked often. How will SpaceX perform the static fires on their first orbital booster? One at a time at first. So contrary to the widespread opinion that SpaceX might fire the inner cluster and then the outer ring to test the Raptor 2 engine setup, SpaceX will take the most careful approach there is. If this is the plan, we might see around 35 static fires before SpaceX is ready and willing to launch that first orbital flight to space. 
It might just be that SpaceX is able to do all these separate static fires in one test though. For those static fires, SpaceX will need a lot of commodities. Liquid oxygen, liquid methane and liquid nitrogen. And SpaceX is ramping up deliveries by quite a bit right now. Dozens of tanker trucks have arrived at the launch site in recent days. Remember when I said that we'd know that we're close to the action as soon as we see tons of tanker trucks arrive at the launch site? This is it. And SpaceX will need many deliveries for the static fires and the orbital flight. But how many exactly? Many. Starship and Super Heavy together form the largest rocket ever built by far. Not just by height, but even more by volume, as a Starship hull just goes straight up and doesn't get thinner the further you go up like, for example, the Saturn V moon rockets did. By tank volume, SpaceX will need to fill around 5,782 cubic meters. That translates to approximately 4,881 tons of fuel and oxidizer. The different tankers for the various commodities hold different amounts of liquid. This is due to the different densities. Liquid oxygen, for example, is denser than liquid methane. Now, you might ask why SpaceX needs so much liquid nitrogen for a launch? Isn't nitrogen inert and used for cryogenic pressure tests? Correct. Do you remember these from the orbital fuel farm? It's a video that Chief made on January 5th two months after he started as the YCAM operator at Starbase and it shows the so-called kettle reboilers. There are plenty of them at Starbase next to the orbital fuel farm storage tanks and those use a lot of liquid nitrogen. SpaceX needs to permanently cool down the liquid gases at the fuel farm. Otherwise they just boil off, turn into gas and vent out to prevent the tanks from overpressure. So SpaceX needs a way to cool liquid oxygen and liquid methane down again and that's what a kettle reboiler is for. The large tank on the right contains liquid nitrogen. On the upper left, warmed up oxygen and methane gases are pumped in. Then they pass through the liquid nitrogen in a loop through thin pipes where they are cooled down and thus start condensing into a liquid again which gets taken out and filled into the storage tanks again. Problem solved. Even though this works like a charm, it does use up a lot of liquid nitrogen and that's why you find this insanely large number of nitrogen tanker trucks on the list for cooling purposes. Do you like today's episode? Supporting us here at Y is as easy as clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel or becoming a channel member by hitting the join button right below the video. Or head over to Patreon by following the link in the description and become an active supporter. Or buy yourself a new shirt in the YWear store if you fancy cool space merch. Thank you so much. So how long will it take SpaceX to be ready for a launch at the current speed? To give you a few numbers, here are the deliveries to the orbital fuel farm from May 31st to June 2nd. At least those that we noticed. It's a bit hard to keep track. 15 LOX deliveries, 11 for liquid methane and 19 tanker trucks filled with liquid nitrogen. That's a total of 45 tanker trucks in 3 days and an average of 15 trucks per day. It's hard to say how much the farm is filled by now, but let's assume it was completely empty on May 31st, so worst case scenario. 366 trucks are needed to fill one starship and properly cool the commodities. 15 trucks per day, that leaves us with a little more than 24, so 25 days. Minus the 5 days that passed since the 31st, 20 days left if SpaceX keeps up the delivery speed. SpaceX has started the process, which certainly is good news. Massive thanks go out to Lolomatico 3D for providing the Y team with the delivery numbers. You rock! The FAA has recently delayed the programmatic environmental assessment results once more. The latest date would now be June 13th. It's not another month and all the steps needed for the conclusion are now in place, including the Section 4F determination, which was the last missing puzzle piece. At least it looks like the FAA is closing in on a final report now, a little more than a week and we should finally know more. New Artemis spacesuits. Next up we have a small sensation. NASA has just picked two partners to create the next generation of spacesuits for the ISS and the moon. 
On June 1st, NASA held a press conference and did a live stream announcing the partners for the next generation spacesuits. And as so often in the new space industry, the partners are commercial companies. It's a change of plans. October 15th of 2019, Jim Bridenstine, back then NASA Administrator, reveals the Artemis Generation spacesuit developed by NASA. In 2021, NASA's Office of Inspector General then issued a withering report stating NASA's problems in the efforts to design these new spacesuits. The report even went so far as to state that the suits would delay NASA's return to the moon. 14 years in the making, $420 million and the result wasn't really up for the task. It's currently inconclusive if this spacesuit's development will continue as there were no clear answers at the press conference held on June 1st. The new contract, closed with Axiom Space and Collins Aerospace, includes a budget of currently $3.5 billion for development through 2034. The suits are supposed to be highly modular, able to evolve and capable of performing missions in space and on the lunar surface. It's not an easy task to develop a spacesuit. Even Elon Musk himself offered SpaceX's service to NASA after the 2021 report got released, but it seems that this task will not go to them this time. It might be that SpaceX is continuing spacesuit development internally, even though they didn't get picked by NASA though. The first crewed Starship mission, Polaris Dawn, has scheduled spacewalks on the task list. There's a growing need for a new spacesuit not only from NASA. Axiom already stated at the recent NASA press conference that they already have customers for upcoming private space flights that want to do an EVA. And as soon as a commercial space station is in orbit, the need for such a suit will be inevitable. It's good to see that NASA is integrating commercial partners into spacesuit development from now on. There is no final date set for when the development is supposed to be finished, but first prototypes would need to be available within the next two years or so if NASA plans to use them for their planned Artemis moon landings. Quick Progress is not exclusive to SpaceX. Brilliant! Today's sponsor is an expert in effective and interactive learning. Brilliant is an excellent and very effective tool for breaking down complex STEM topics for you to learn effortless and effective. Courses like scientific thinking, math, computer science and logic challenge you to learn new things in a visually stimulating and bite-sized hands-on approach. Even though the topics go in-depth, Brilliant offers you a low-pressure environment. Help is always around the corner and at Brilliant you learn intuitively and with fun. When I need to kill some time, you won't find me gaming on my phone. Instead, I often open the Brilliant app and search for a topic I always wanted to know more about. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash whataboutit or click on the link in the description and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. You learn something new every day and in return you help What About It as well. Today's supporter shoutout goes to Gravely Dunn, Michael Babushkin, Hank Silliers, Andy Green, Thales of Miletus and many others. You rock so much! Having you and all the other supporters behind the Y team makes all the difference and the Y family is happy to have you with us. Without you all this would not be possible, so thank you from the entire team including me for helping us achieve the impossible. Enjoy your completely ad free and early release and remember to hop on our supporter exclusive discord to have a chat with the rest of the community and with me. I know, I know, I uh, trust me, I know. <laughs> oh, hello Lolomatico. <laughs> Let's do it again. Let's do that again. That was my head tanking. That was my head tank venting. So here we go again. Real quick, oh my darling. Oh, la 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 la, he's working around in the studio. Oh, 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 oh. I'm back.